Fulford said to Chief Investment Officer of Asia at Bering Asset Management, which uh, oversees $13 billion in Asian equities, uh, joins us this morning. Good to have you back. It's been a while. Long time no see. Uh, what's, what are you doing in the markets right now? What are you advising clients to do? Well, actually, uh, our view is that uh, over the long term, actually, Asia fundamentals remain very strong. That the, the underlying growth uh, is, as we all know, is, uh, is increasingly driven by domestic demand, so it's, uh, it's continued to be very buoyant. But there's a pos possibility of black swan events, for example, coming up from Europe, um, and of course, the negativeness from the U.S. doesn't help. So the macro shocks, uh, there's still a possibility. So for the time being, I think we just want to be um, stay cautious, mm -hmm. stay on the sideline, but for people who can withstand short-term volatilities yeah. and they want long, they, are, they, they look at long-term investment horizon, let's say three, five right. years or so. There are bargains to be seen than if you have a long-term horizon. We are seeing professional or institutional investors beginning to become more interested um, uh -huh. in Asia, especially after the sell-off in August. It, okay, so becoming more interested. What are they interested in doing and buying? Because Asia, even before the sell-off in August, it was already quite cheap, uh -huh. while the growth remains very strong but so after the 10 percent or so drop in August it looks even cheaper mm -hmm. so for people who wants to diversify the assets for example like from my point of view they buy Asia not just for growth right. people want to buy Asia for diversification right. also because they've under invested here. okay what's cheap what's cheap right now how do you judge cheapness and value well um, <laughs> is that a good question it's a relative okay um, I think at the end of the day, the underlying economic growth of Asia remains more like two, at least two times faster mm -hmm. than the developed market. While at the same time, um, global investors they have a lot of assets in the developed uh, market. So, um, and the valuation, the, if you look at Asia from a PE point of view, for example, historical PE yeah. it is uh, more than one standard deviation below historical average. Um, the, yes, earnings might be revised down, but um, from a um, Historical perspective, uh -huh. um, we don't look particularly expensive either. Okay. And versus developed markets, we are not. You're being expensive. coy, Wilfred. You're not talking sectors. What's going on? Well, um, I know you <laughs> asked these questions because, well, um, let's uh, put it this way. Yeah. Uh, for people who have a long term investment horizon, or right. what they should have as the core holdings in other sectors. Definitely, they would need to have exposures to domestic growth sectors mm -hmm. for Asia. Like um, consumer staples. Consumer staples, actually, consumer discretionary mm -hmm. for some of these Utilities companies maybe? do very well. Mm -hmm. um, if you talk about telecoms or utilities, the more defensive sectors, they might perform better in yeah. this kind of environment. So they might outperform the market for this month or for the rest of this year, for example. But for people who want a longer term uh, return, like three years or so, mm -hmm. um, these sectors, they might underperform some of the more um, consumption-driven sectors. And where do you put your money? Uh, we've been talking about China a lot. Indonesia has done very well this year. Thailand seems to be a particular interest to investors these days. Yes. China, we are advocating that um, investors should um, allocate um, more money to mm -hmm. China um, at this point, especially after the drop. How much should they August. allocate in terms of portfolio? 25 percent? I think. Well, um, how exact percentage is different by person, but I think for um, professional investors, let's say, which have a benchmark, for example, um, a lot of people, they were underweight in China because they were concerned about the tightening um, mm -hmm. in China. But uh, as we enter into the summer of this year, starting from a few months ago, we sense that China, the policy tilt, was shifted from the concern on high inflation to the concern on lower growth. Mm -hmm. So that's what my about Indonesia and policy. Thailand themselves? It seems to be the crowded place so far for this year. Yes, for the ASEAN countries, including Thailand or Indonesia, actually they have performed very well yeah. this year. Even for Thailand, right. given they have political concerns. But I think for these ASEAN countries in general, they yeah. do suffer less from inflation, mm -hmm. and they are less, uh, as a whole, less affected by the slowdown in export right. from the developed market. So okay. And quickly, I just wanted to ask you about the move from the Swiss franc. What did you think of that? Did that have any, uh, I guess, any jarring of your portfolio or your investment? Well, um, I'm not an expert on Europe, but then uh, from an invest Asian investor point of view, um, if they are buying more euro, for example, um, would that mean you know, they are ready to help into the whole European situation? Would that signal uh, a move from the other um, non-euro central banks or Europe in general, that mm -hmm. people might be working closer together to help Europe as a whole. Right.
Okay, so Asia might be a good buy if you have a long-term perspective, and you know this uh, franc move may actually be beneficial to uh, the eurozone itself. Yes. Okay, Wilfred, thanks for dropping by today. Good to see you as always. Uh, Wilfred Sitt of uh, Bearing Asset Management.